on the Texas A&M Sports Network. From Learfield, live from Ludie's Country Store and Barbecue, on Harvey Road in College Station, this is the Buzz Williams Show. Presented by Bud Light, it's for the fans. And by Ludie's Country Store and Barbecue. Visit Ludie's.com to find real Texas barbecue near you. Now, here is the voice of Texas A&M basketball, Andrew Monaco. Howdy, and welcome to the Buzz Williams Show. We are at Rudy's Country Store and Barbecue. We're at 504 Harvey Road in College Station, and there is still plenty of time for you to come down and join us. As for the next hour, we talk Aggie basketball with the head coach of the Fighting Texas Aggies, Buzz Williams. We thank you so much for joining us all along the Texas A&M Sports Network. Perhaps you're joining us via the 12th Man Mobile app or the Varsity Network app from Learfield. Or maybe you're streaming on the Texas A&M Basketball Facebook page as we go behind the mic. However you are joining us, thank you for doing so. Coming up this hour, we will talk about the most recent win for the Aggies, the 85-65 win over New Orleans. That pushed the Aggies' mark to 7-1, and one, and they will take that record into Houston on Saturday for a matchup with TCU. 5.30 is the tip from Toyota Center. We'll get started at 5 o'clock on the Dos Equis Show. Speaking of getting started, we're just getting started here. The Buzz Williams Show will roll on from Rudy's. Again, so glad you're with us. Stay with us. This is Aggie Basketball from Learfield. Join Texas A&M Student Athlete Advisory Council and Frontier in donating toys to children in need this holiday season. Bring your new unwrapped toys to either the Texas A&M men's and women's basketball games at Reed Arena on December 14th or the 19th. Visit 12thman.com slash toy drive for full details. It is the Buzz Williams Show. We are at Rudy's, the head coach of the Fighting Texas Aggies. Buzz Williams is here. See, well, I told you this last year when you guys were in the hallway at 12th Man Productions, that you, you guys should just sit in these chairs. Steve Miller and I could just point to you and say, get a commercial in, because I would love, I don't know how much, I don't know if an hour would do, Buzz, if you Not and Gary Coach Blair got together. <laughs> the only thing I would need to do in the hour is just make sure I knew when to send it to commercial. And I'd just hold up my finger, Coach, you got one minute. <laughs> got to go to commercial. I think the way to do it uh, with Coach Blair's show how many minutes of the 60 are commercials? For his show, you're looking at about 15. Yeah, so just run the 15. Just come on the air. <laughs> this is the Gary Blair show. Yeah. Uh, take a potty break. Yeah. Get a glass of tea. Yeah. And we're going to start in 15 minutes, and then we're going to go 45 straight minutes. I like it. And then, and then it's I just like one it. long sentence, and yeah. you don't have to interrupt Coach. <laughs> you know how much knowledge would be in that 45 minutes? Coach is my hero. I love Coach. And uh, Coach should have a show whether he's coaching or not. Anybody that's done the things that he's done, I don't think anybody talks about it just because I love him so much. I sent uh, Bob Starkey a $50 bill from Virginia Tech when Coach Blair's book came out. And I told Coach Starkey in the note, do not tell Coach that I'm sending you the money and do not ask Coach to sign the book. Because as soon as he knows it's me asking for the book, he's not going to take the money. He's deserving of the money no matter what charity it's going to. But I just want the book so I can learn. 1972, he was a PE teacher. That was the year that Title IX went into effect. And then if you think about what he did in high school and then what he did as an assistant, he won a national championship as an assistant. And then you think about what he did as a head coach at each institution that he's been at. I was uh, at the game yesterday. Obviously, I've known Coach Schaefer for a long time. He's married to Holly, who was an assistant at UTA when I was an assistant at UTA when Coach was the head coach at Sam Houston. But Coach Schaefer worked for Coach Blair prior to a and I think it was 15 years that Coach Schaefer worked for Coach Blair, and his tenure with Coach Blair started at Arkansas. But, you know, it's easy – just because there won't be coaches in my generation that have done what Coach Blair's done. But basically, he had a career at each institution he's been at. We just think it's just Texas A&M. No, he, he did the same thing at Arkansas. He did the same thing everywhere he's been. And I think that that's uh, a coach that's a generation removed from him. 
I don't think because of the exposure and the way uh, athletics goes now, and even if you haven't paid attention to athletics, if you've only watched it since Halloween or if you've only paid attention to it since Labor Day, when you look at how things have changed, the model is completely changed, mm -hmm. there will not be any more Gary Blairs in any sport. And the only Gary Blairs that will remain are the ones that have been able to adapt and adopt the way that he has. And uh, he's went through seismic changes from Title IX through 2021. But even in what's taken place in college athletics over the last 100 days, I mean, there's a coaching change today in the ACC and the Pac-12, and they've been talking about it on Twitter and TV for four days. And, and – uh, the families that are affected, mm -hmm. the staff that is affected, the coaches that are affected, uh, the families. It's just a completely different model than what it is. And I think that's why I uh, honor and respect to the Coach Blairs of the world because I don't think there will be any more of those. The coaching tree, the player tree, the players who are now coaches tree, the players who are now great business women or yeah. families or whatever, the the – the ripple effect of yes. Coach Blair goes far and wide, Absolutely. doesn't it? Yeah, because the, the, so many of those children that he coached are now mothers and VPs and presidents mm -hmm. and coaches and ADs. And, uh, yeah, it's it's not just the players. It's, it's all of the people that were on the team bus each of those years that he's been a coach. And, you know, like when you start talking about the people on the team bus, what about the managers? What about the video coordinators? What about the trainers? Like – over and over those are those are uh, genealogical impacts uh how who he was and how he has operated and how he's led and how he's taught it's so much bigger than x's and o's and uh i think now because of all that goes on in the exposure and the money and all of the things that come with it i just think that he's a gem that will be hard to replicate anymore i thought it was interesting that uh when he gave him <laughs> when he Thank gave you, on his in his look at that press conference yeah like 50 years of coaching this yeah. is the the token that he just gave him uh, yeah like 50 i'm not 50 i'm not 50 right he's been coaching right. 50 and since yeah i'm hoping he's, i am coaching at he's, 50. he's really just a center fielder at heart you know that <laughs> Right? That's all he is. I think he likes anything <laughs> with a ball. Yeah, it's exactly, golf. It's exactly, it's exactly softball, right. Softball, baseball. Yeah, we haven't even we haven't even touched on the charities. But when he said at his press conference about the, the greatest Aggie being R.C. Slocum, and I and I told him when I was in his I, office, I we're going to say right. that about Gary Blair. Aren't yes, we? That, I think they're the same. I, 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 in my opinion, I mean, I write Coach Slocum every month. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen him twice since I've been employed here, uh, and I've written him. 27 consecutive months just because those those uh not because of texas a&m but it, just because uh that type of coach that type of human that type of dad that type of leader that believer that that's that's why i wanted to coach mm -hmm. and so any way that i can honor those types of men that's that's the least that I can do. But I do agree with – I watched Coach Blair's press conference. I was uh, I was on the road recruiting, and uh, Evan sent me the link so that I could click it and watch. And uh, what he said about Coach was right. Yeah, and all I know is watching that, I went through a, a torrent of emotions. Yeah. Laughed, cried, chuckled. <laughs> yeah, and I think I, – I, I don't think that there's any easy way for something like that to happen. You know, like – I think Coach Blair probably thought he was prepared and you could tell he had some notes. And then when you get going, just one thing leads to another. And it's hard to encapsulate uh, 50 years of a career. And you want to say thank you to so many people, but you also want to be respectful of the current players mm -hmm. on your team. And I think, I think that was his struggle. Like, I don't want boots from Vic. I want to I try to beat Texas. Right. But I don't want to not do the appropriate thing relative to honoring the profession of coaches. I think, I think every coach that ever gets to that point, and that's why I don't think there will be yeah. many of those. You know, I, I don't – it's – what are you going to say? And how are you going to keep the same train of thought because it is so emotional? 
We will continue with the Buzz Williams Show. We'll come back. We'll talk about the 7-1 and one Aggies when we return to Rudy's. This is Aggie Basketball from Learfield. We continue with the Buzz Williams Show from Rudy's 504 Harvey Road here in College Station. A chance to talk about the 7-1 and one Aggies coming off their win over New Orleans last week and a little bit of a stretch for this team. Some practice time for this team before taking on TCU on Saturday. We will head to Houston for that one from Toyota Center Saturday at 5.30. And we'll get started at 5 o'clock with our Dos Equis tip-off show. But, Coach, as we look back at that win against New Orleans, you had touched on last Monday about your players and the bench and the double digits in minutes. And that depth was there. No Henry Coleman, but you had Hayden Hefner, who was almost at double figures. Yep. But once again, that depth, and you really don't lose anything coming up when, when you have these players come off the bench either. Well, I think um, as the season unfolds, I hope that there is improvement in consistency. Uh, through eight games, we are playing 11 guys, double-figure minutes. I don't know how realistic that is. I do think our depth can help us. I don't know that our depth will hurt us. I think the thing that's going to become more difficult as the value of a possession continues to increase is you can't give away possessions wondering if any of the 11 – are going to help because uh, if there's 200 minutes in a game and in essence everybody's playing more than 10, we're not going to have the margin where we can give 20 of those 200 away on empty minutes. Mm -hmm. Having said that, if you had to say, hey, Buzz, you can only play seven, I don't know which seven I would say. I don't know which nine I would say. I think that uh, the more we practice and the more we play in some of those games, we will learn some of that. But I do hope that our depth is helpful. But similar to what you said, I, I, don't, uh, I don't know if it's counter or if it's negative or if it's positive. Well, there's not much difference Buzz, put that guy in. Okay, let's try him. Well, what about that guy? Yeah, I'll try him. Well, I don't know if the first guy or the second guy, which one's better? I don't know. They're kind of the same. Well, this night, one was better. Tomorrow night, two was better. I, I think that's what we're going to have to figure out is whenever player one subs in, we know what we're getting. And whenever player two comes in, we know what we're getting. And I think a lot of that will come from practice. You know, uh, we, whether it's a drill, whether it's a game, whether it's a mini game, we're constantly trying to figure out this group is best defensively or this group is best offensively. And there's a lot of analytics, and I could talk for days and days on this. I study it like crazy. And we've always kind of had our own version of analytics throughout my career. Uh, but in the same way that Moneyball has kind of taken over Major League Baseball, some of that's been going on in the NBA over the last six to eight years. And our administration allowed us this year, I've been studying it since I've been here, there's a company um, that kind of does that. And uh, the information that comes from that company specific to our team and our opponent is incredible. And, like, you can talk about anything you want to talk about, rebounding, turnovers, uh, pace, uh, statistics as far as shooting. But then as time goes, it's kind of like anything else mathematically. The larger the sample size gets, the more refined you can make decisions. And through eight games, we've learned a lot. Uh, and similar to what I have talked to you about uh, in the last couple of weeks, in Vegas and uh, against New Orleans, we're pretty good in the first six seconds of the shot clock. We're pretty good in the last six seconds of the shot clock. In between, not so good. Uh, our turnover rate is too high, but when it's lower, we're better. Uh, when the opponent shoots it, 
and they get the rebound versus the opponent shoot it, and we get the rebound. Distinct difference. And so as you collect all of this data, you're able to kind of figure out, hey, that guy's important to us on the glass. That guy helps us not turn it over. That guy, uh, whether he's shooting a layup or sh making a three, uh, in between the wood twos, yeah, that's a bad shot. That's a bad shot in the middle of the clock. That's a bad shot for him. And conversely, that's a bad shot for us. And so, like, some of that stuff is beginning to be revealed. Uh, TJ, Lyle, Devin uh, study it a lot. And uh, they've taught me kind of how to process it. Like, I have in my bag tonight to study that same synopsis on TCU. That's part of what the company does. And partly just because I'm a nerd and I don't want to act like it and I love numbers. Like, I love studying all of that because it helps you have evidence on what you should practice. It helps you have evidence on how to game plan specific to your team but also specific to the opponent. And similar to what I was saying to you, like, I think the line is going to be so thin for us. Mm -hmm. We need every competitive advantage possible. And we're learning a lot through that data but they also help us with a lot of stuff that comes from practice because we send them the practice stats. So it's not just game night. But it also allows you, like I'm watching uh, tape tomorrow with our guys, 12-minute sessions, two kids every 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it's just one component of the data that I know that we have to improve at. So you have the ball and uh, you pass it to Ian. And I'm guarding you, but when you pass it to him, he drives, and it's my turn to contest. I'm not guarding him, but he got past his guy. When I contest the shot as the closest defender, what's the percentage that he makes on me? But it's the same principle. He has the ball. He passes it to you, and I close out, and you're about to shoot the three. You are my guy. I'm the closest defender to contest, what percentage do you shoot? So it's only talking about contested shot percentage. So am I good at that? Am I bad at that? Am I late? Is the angle at which I close you out at bad? Do I reach? Do I foul? There's a lot of stuff. And so that's one area tomorrow that we're going to focus on. And I think those sorts of minutia when you can teach it to our guys and you can show them clips and they can see the data, they go, oh, yeah, I've never heard that before. And that can be a competitive advantage for us. It's, it's one thing to get the numbers. One, you apply it. Two, the way you apply it in bite-sized nuggets, yeah. you have to make it digestible. You've talked before. You can't give no. any student athlete too much. No. Then they get inundated, correct? Yeah, you, you have to boil it down to the lowest common denominator. You know, like... Uh, this is eight twelfths. No, it's not eight twelfths. You know what I mean? No, you divide, divide. You know, like, and I talk to our guys about that. Yep. It's not eight twelfths. Remember, divide four into it. Now, what is it? It's, oh, yeah, it's two thirds. Yep. Yeah, yeah, two thirds. Mm -hmm. Right now, they can understand it. And so, whether it's data, even in scouting reports, as we've talked about, like, you can't give them a book report anymore. Right. Hey, this is how you win. This is what you have to do. This is what we have to do. This is what the book says. I already read the book. This is what we have to do. And then you have to practice those things. And like any coach would tell you, uh, you, you want to practice what you do a lot. And so you have to figure out what it is that you do a lot and then practice that. And I think a lot of coaches say that in a positive way. We need to practice this because we're going to do this a lot and we're good at this. I think that is true, but I also think you need to practice a lot what you're bad at because that's what the opponent is going to attack. Right. If you're bad at it, then they're going to know you're bad at it. So you need to practice what you're bad at just as much as you need to practice what you're good at. And, you know, it's kind of like the whatever uh, John Maxwell, hey, only pay attention to your strengths because the more time you spend on your weaknesses, your weaknesses will improve 1%. But if you pay attention to your strengths, they'll improve dramatically better. Yeah, I understand that, but when you're talking about ball, mm -hmm. that's not exclusively the truth. You want those habits to be the strengths. You, the roots are the strengths. Yes. Now, can we make those roots even stronger? Yes. By we ha we have to know what uh, we have to know the lupin 
that poisons the roots. And we got to figure out how to get the lupin out of the way. I've never heard that in sports, but I'm never going to forget it now. Yeah, you know what lupin is. It's poison, right? Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. It's know. a lupin bean. Right. You ever had a lupin bean? I don't think I have. No, you haven't. It's poison. <laughs> That's right. That's, if I did, I wouldn't be here. It's spelled with an I, not with an E. Okay. So if it's on your test tomorrow, <laughs> Ian, it's with an I. Speaking of that, Ian has the question when we come back. It's going to be a little bit into what we've been talking about. It's called a segue. When we come back to the Buzz Williams Show, we're at Rudy's. Stay with us. This is Aggie Basketball from Learfield. We continue with the Buzz Williams Show from Rudy's. 504 Harvey Road here in College Station. Chance to talk to head coach Buzz Williams. We were talking about the analytics and we were talking about the stats and how to boil them down. So our question as we get each week from Ian Curtis question to coach is what's the most important stat in college basketball I'm going to give you time to think I'm going to give you an answer here Ian Uh, one time Greg Popovich Rick Carlisle were talking and their front offices obviously the analytical side for both and yet they said turnovers and offensive rebounds were things that they focused in a box score they think but I don't know if that's the most important for you. I think those are the two things. Uh, like uh, I just talked to Coach Blair when I went to the game yesterday. I rarely look at the scoreboard in Reed Arena when I'm coaching the game. And then if I have a question, uh, if I happen to have on my glasses, I'll look up there. If I don't have on my glasses because I'm sweating, I'll ask the kids, hey, what does this say? But uh, yesterday, the University of Texas shot 14 more balls than Texas A&M. And so there's two ways that you shoot more balls. Uh, You turn it over or they shoot it and they get their own rebound. It's really hard mathematically when the number is above 10, unless you're doing something just incredibly good and they're doing something incredibly bad, 14 more shots if nobody turns it over and nobody gets a second shot. Just mathematically, 14 extra shots is really difficult to overcome. And so uh, I think most coaches would tell you turnovers and offensive rebounds, but that's because that's a derivative of the number of shot attempts. So, like, uh, look at all the games tonight. Texas Southern was 0-7 tonight, and they beat Florida. Florida is 20th in the country. Florida had lost one game entering tonight. Um, I haven't looked at the box score, but any team we play, until we play them, they print up the box scores for me every night. So tomorrow morning when I go in uh, to the office, any team will play, the box score's there. And the first thing that I always look at is just like what I did with Coach Blair. Texas A&M shot 50 balls yesterday. University of Texas shot 64. And so sometimes the numbers can be deceiving. If you shoot 64, if they shoot 64 and you shoot 50, maybe you shot a bunch of free throws. In other words, you didn't shoot as many balls because they were fouling you. But normally it equates to turnovers and offensive rebounds. But I always want to know how many balls did we shoot and we need to shoot more. And how many free throws did we make? And we need to make more than they attempted. If you're making more than the opponent is attempting, you're getting them in foul trouble. The clock is stopped. And it normally means you're, not necessarily, but it probably means your turnover rate is is low. And so uh, all of those things. Uh, You always talk about live turnovers because that leads to broken floor. Yeah. Do you mind an unselfish turnover uh, along the lines of trying to make that one more pass? No. Is there a degree? No. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a line. I, um, like when Dre catches it, I want Dre to shoot it. He's shooting 60% from three. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Q catches it, I want Q to shoot it because he's shooting 45% from three. Or I want him to go sh- in a straight line downhill. Um, that's kind of specific to their game in their effectiveness, but it's also specific to that's what our team needs from you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think Marcus Williams is really gifted with the ball in his hands. And where he gets in trouble is he's predetermining this is the pass that I'm about to make. It's not from a selfish standpoint. It's from a very unselfish standpoint. But his turnover rate is too high. And I would say that uh, 25% of his turnovers are I'm coming off this ball screen and this is who's about to be open. Uh, like four, four played uh, against New Orleans with zero turnovers. His first Division One game was zero turnovers. When four comes in the game, he can really score, but he plays at a fast pace. And he had ten turnovers in Vegas. He had four against Wisconsin. But that's the first time he's played against men that size. It's the first time he's played against that type of ball screen coverage. And so the read that he thought was going to be there, it wasn't there. And it, he was – semi making the decision before he should have and so uh, i don't i don't think that i necessarily am ever negative towards unselfishness that's what you want i think we have improved in our assisted basket rate uh, we've made it a obviously lyle emphasizes that a lot with our team the ball's not getting stuck it's a lot better than it was the first three or four games but I think that as the season unfolds, when you're sharing, when it touches your hands and you're the catch-shoot guy, yeah, that's your shot. And so we talk a lot about your shot at the right time. I can't tell you what your shot is, but my shot is I'm standing still and my man had to help and I'm just standing here waiting on somebody to make a perfect pass so I have enough time to catch it and shoot it. That's my shot. Me trying to put it on the floor and get somebody else in rotation, I'm not going to do that. Right. And so our guys kind of know that. They kind of know. Like Hassan, Hassan's got to quit turning the ball over at the rate he is. He knows that. But all, uh, all but two of his turnovers come after the third dribble. Yeah, cause, hey, man, you're just dribbling it too much. You're waiting too long. Pass the ball to the first open man. But it's the unselfishness I don't think that you ever want to be negative towards. And that pass can't be at the ankles, right? You want that No, pass we call it catch. strikes or balls. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that we uh, monitor in practice. You know, just literally, that was a ball. Yeah. Uh, you, you can't shoot balls. You can shoot strikes. And so that was one thing that we charted every day during OTAs in the summer. We got to throw strikes. We got to throw strikes because balls – when you get a team into rotation and your guy helped and now I throw a ball at your knees, okay, well, the ball is stuck because you can't shoot and Monaco can't dribble. So now you're just waiting on somebody else to come get it back from you and now the defense is loaded again. And that shot clock is getting it, tripping away. Yeah, it's just about to be a flat ball screen. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. He's Buzz Williams. We will talk about the next opponent for the Aggies, TCU. When we come back to the Buzz Williams Show. This is Aggie Basketball from Learfield. Basketball and barbecue lovers know the perfect brisket needs the right wood, and Rudy's smokes all their meats using their delicious signature rubs in 100% oak-fired pits. Get your real Texas barbecue fix today at Rudy's or on the web at rudys.com. We continue with the Buzz Williams Show. We are at Rudy's. So glad that you are with us. Before we get to TCU and the practice leading up to that, uh, Antonio McKenzie is your director of player relations. What an incredible hire. I could talk about Antonio forever. It's like the, I mean, obviously a lot of, I think there are seven, I'd have to think about this. I think there are seven students, former students on our staff. They either played for us, they were a manager for us, or they were a graduate assistant for us. So I take a lot of great pride, humble pride, in knowing kids until young men, until men in their careers, men with wives, men with families, uh, probably to the detriment at times. Uh, I have been over-the-top loyal to those who have been loyal to me. I don't know if that's right. 
Uh, in my soul, it's right. I'm not saying it's right by Texas A&M or the SEC or big boys business that we're in, and I completely own that. But just how I was raised, uh, that's how I was raised. And so I'm going to do that to a default. Uh, Luke Killen was here mm -hmm. uh, when I was hired. He had already been told he was going to go uh, within the athletic department. He was just there to kind of help get us situated. Antonio McKenzie was here. Uh, Antonio has been employed as our chaplain through Nations of Coaches. If you've never heard of Nations of Coaches, it's, the, it's a similar organization as FCA. Uh, he is an incredible, incredible human being. He's married. He has five children. He's from Dallas. He he was in the he attended uh, a school in the same district as four. He has never asked for anything. Uh, and when when the spot became available, like I never even interviewed Antonio uh, at all. I never asked him a question. Nothing. Uh, our kids are unbelievably thankful for their relationship with Antonio. He's not a coach but he has been a part of every single thing we've done every single day since I've been here on the floor, in the film room. Uh, he is a part of every individual workout, just over there clapping, saying good job, just to be there to support. He's been at everything uh, since day number one. And uh, so I told J-Mo, hey, I would really like to hire him. I would like to hire him as soon as possible, whatever that process is. He'll sign the paperwork. And uh, I told our team, I guess you were there, mm -hmm. uh, at Shoot Around. That was the last day of November when we played New Orleans. And uh, that had the paperwork and all of the processes that go, that had been going on the last couple of weeks. And uh, at halftime of the New Orleans game, he had a family emergency. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had to leave the game. And so we were planning to announce it December the 1st. Mm -hmm. That's when his employment began. And uh, instead, we had to wait till he came back uh, from what he's been dealing with. And so it became official today. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, his title is Director of Player Relations. Uh, Joe Fulce, who played for us, mm -hmm. uh, is the job that became vacant. Uh, and that's who Antonio replaced. And he, he'll be phenomenal. Uh, I, I have never heard a coach, a player, anybody around or near our program who has ever uttered a bad syllable about him. And uh, really happy for him and his play and his family, uh, and thankful that he's officially. Even Mason told me a while ago. Uh, he goes, Dad, has he not always been employed by Texas A&M? I'm like, No, he's been employed by Texas A&M starting today. Like everybody thinks that right. he's been employed by A&M. Right. Uh, and he never has been until today. The player reaction and the emotion, that joy yes. for him, uh, if that doesn't make you smile, it, it, that was it real. made my heart happy. Yeah, that was real. Yeah. That was uh, that was so yeah. – and, and, you know, I had been telling Luke, and I would text him at night just occasionally, hey, what's the latest on hiring Antonio? And so I was kind of wearing him out on that. <laughs> and uh, when we finished shoot around, as soon as we finished the prayer walk, and, you know, we closed it down. He came up to me, he goes, Coach, it's official. And I go, where's all the guys? Let's tell them. And, you know, half of them had already went had to, to the locker room. Now y'all come back. <laughs> and I had never done that. I don't think I've ever done that in my whole career. And so everybody knew something was going on. And Antonio didn't know. No, nobody knew it as official. Like, it had just whatever happens when you hire someone, like, it, it had just became official. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. Dude, that joy for one another, Buzz. Yes. I don't know how it translates into wins or losses, but it just makes teams better. Absolutely. Yeah, that's part. There, there's, uh, what was it, Einstein said not everything that counts can be counted. I think Albert Einstein said that. And uh, that's, that's for sure what that is. That's wonderful. That he's, matters. He's with us. He makes your day better. He's just one of those people. Absolutely. That when you see him and, you, and you're with him for any amount of time, it could be three seconds. That's right. He just makes everything better, and now he is with us. We will talk about TCU, the next opponent for Texas A&M, on Saturday when we return to the Buzz Williams Show. Stay with us. This is Aggie Basketball from Learfield.
not everyone is a morning person yet, but with Costa Vita's new breakfast tacos, everyone will be. Try our bacon, egg, and cheese, or specialties like the machaca beef and egg, or sweet pork, egg, and cheese. Stop by our drive through any day from 7 to 10.30 a.m. Order online through the Costa Vita app or the website, Becoming a Morning Person, Become a Morning Person at Costa Vita. This is the final segment of the Buzz Williams Show. We are at Rudy's 504 Harvey Road here in College Station. The Aggies taking on TCU. That will be on Saturday. 5.30 is the tip. Toyota Center in Houston. And uh, 5 o'clock with the Dos Equis tip-off show. And a chance to practice leading up to that. Then it gets busy again, but we'll focus on just the, the first game on, on Saturday. But you had laid out last Monday what you wanted to do in these um, – Almost two weeks. It really yeah. is some practice time for you and this team, isn't yeah, it? I, I've never had this happen in my career. And uh, Coach Lair was asking me the other day if I wanted to try to arrange it so that we could do it again next year. I told him, I said, well, let's see how the next couple of weeks go, and then, I'll, then we'll have more evidence. I think in some ways it's been really healthy. Eight games in 15 days is a lot, particularly as a college athlete, uh, because you don't get to practice very much. And then, so now we've been, we practiced, uh, we played on Tuesday of last week. We were off on Wednesday. We worked Thursday, Friday, Saturday morning. We were off yesterday. Today was our 35th practice of the year, and it was top five practice. I think, uh, you know, kids want to play, and uh, coaches want to coach. And old school coaches want to practice more than they want to play a game. And you hear coaches say all that. Um, I think it's been really good. Uh, so we're going to work tomorrow. We're bringing in officials uh, like some local high school officials that are allowed to come to campus. And then we'll be off on Wednesday. And then Thursday will be two-day prep. Friday will be one-day prep. We're going to do some community service stuff in uh, Houston Friday afternoon and then play Saturday evening. So uh, to be able to have, in essence, five days of work, exclusively about you and only about you and not having to talk about somebody else's team and somebody else's plays. Um, I think that's good. That that won't happen again the rest of the year. Right. And normally once the season starts, the only break you have is normally uh, something is weird about finals and everybody's different. That's why there's not very many games tonight because finals are beginning to start. Uh, and then, you, you know, you have – two and a half days off, three days off for Christmas. But that doesn't feel like you're getting to practice and work on yourself. So I kind of like how it's how it's played out. I may feel differently uh, because we've been off so long by the time we tip off on Saturday. But it's been good, I think, for our guys physically. I think it's been good for our guys mentally. Our coaches have really been able to kind of lock in on some specifics that we need to concentrate on. We had early bird this morning. Uh, and Devin ran early bird, and it was superb. And you could see it translate to practice today, which is why I thought practice was so good. Uh, but you, normally when you have early bird, it's to close down the previous game mm -hmm. or to get ready for the next game. Well, we had early bird last Thursday, and it was about us. And then we had early bird again today, and it was about us. And I think it kind of goes back to what we were talking two weeks ago. There, there is probably something to be said that you spend more time on yourself than you do the opponent because it allows you to hold guys to be accountable because that's all you're talking about, and that's also all they're hearing and all they're doing. Uh, so there's, there's a line in there somewhere. I don't know that there's an exact science to it, but there is some line in there. Uh, do you like getting a chance to play in Houston? Yeah, I've never played at the Toyota Center uh, the last time I was at the Toyota Center Elevation Church, uh, my friend uh, Pastor Furtick was on tour. And uh, so my family and I went there, I think, on Halloween. But uh, I saw Jimmy Butler play there in the finals mm. one year against the Rockets. Mm -hmm. But I have never coached uh, at the Toyota Center. Yeah. So I think, I think that'll be fun. Is that also good for recruiting? Yeah, I think any time. You know, like all players want to play in the NBA. So to be able to you know, uh, play on an NBA floor office or have a locker room at the NBA facility. Yeah, I think that's good. And, you know, like so much of scheduling is so more complicated than recruiting now. 
well, I don't know if it's more complicated than recruiting now with all of the changes, but there's a lot to it. Figuring out a date, figuring out a neutral site, and the dates working out and the opponent and then the SEC net number, all of that takes a lot of work. Coach Lair spends an enormous amount of time on that. So uh, to be able to play them, uh, TCU, to be able to play in Houston, I think we're going to have a lot of uh, – we've invited a lot of our former players. Mm. Uh, I think that will end up being – another positive thing about it. So, yeah, it'll be good. Should be the a good number of Aggies in the stands I as hope well so. for that one. I hope so. I hope so. Kind of make that a home game. That's a, right. A de facto hope, home game. It, it felt like that in Fort Worth. There, there, was a, there was a good number of Aggies in Fort Worth last year at the – well, I guess it wasn't. Yeah, it was last year, wasn't it? Yeah, it was yeah. last year. It, uh, yeah, I don't know how – I was that restricted on how many could yeah. come, Evan? Yeah, so yeah. all of that was weird. That's but, why it'll be fun. Yeah. They can, it'll be a little more normal, I absolutely. think. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Beat the yeah. hell out of TCU on yeah. Saturday. There'll, there'll be, I hope some of that goes on for sure. <laughs> absolutely. Coach, thank you so much. Yeah, I've enjoyed you it. Thank a great you so week. much. You bet, man. It's Buzz thank Williams. You. It's the Buzz Williams Show. Hey, a reminder that the next episode of Rooted will come out next Monday. Uh, we've had four of those episodes. You can get that on the Texas A&M Basketball social media channels. So the next episode of Rooted is next Monday. We will join you on Saturday. Dr. John Thornton and I, 5 o'clock, Dos Equis tip-off show, the tip between the Aggies and TCU at 5.30. Brock Schofield has been the producer of the Buzz Williams Show. In our Learfield studios, Kevin Menchow is the engineer. For Coach Buzz, I'm Andrew Monaco. Thanks for joining us. This is Aggie Basketball from Learfield.